So, okay. So we're going to look at uh, Elk Rapids Iron Company and the general bigger view of the charcoal iron industry in the United States. And when you get into what how the furnace is worked, this is a cut of one of the furnaces. And they, they pretty much, as you'll see, remained about the same from about the 1600s, roughly up until you know the 1900s at least in basic technology. Now, some things changed. This one here, obviously, and a lot of the early ones had a water wheel to pump the, the bellows that, that uh, drove the air through the twir. We'll see like with Elk Rapids, by that time, the 1870s, they were using gasoline engines or steam engines in either case to drive those. But what you needed, of course, is the iron ore and a source of fuel, which charcoal, there was a lot of wood in the United States. And we use charcoal much longer than the rest of the world. Although today there's still some uh, charcoal industry in uh, Brazil where they still have a lot of wood in uh, rural parts of China. Okay. And you also need limestone flux. We'll talk about that. I think one of the most unusual things is we have about 900 known locations and they look like, these are some across the country, but some of them are just little piles of rubble. And there's a lot of unknown locations. We're guessing there were probably over the years, maybe 1,500 furnaces. So there's lots, lots of room here for original, I guess, industrial archaeology to find them, locate them, maybe even restore them. Um, if we look at the charcoal industry in general, okay, it started in the 1600s, as you might expect, in the Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Virginia, the first colonies, of course. They used bog iron ore, and charcoal, of course, again, was available. So you, you, you got the hardwood, and we'll talk more about that, and you can make charcoal, and that became the fuel. In the 1700s, they moved more to Pennsylvania. West Virginia, well, it wasn't West Virginia then, but Pennsylvania, uh, back, back hills of Kentucky and Virginia. And they, they got to be rather big operations. And in fact, they called them iron plantations. Now they had, you know, they not only were, used the iron for the cast things like pots, pans, so forth, fire, backs. But they also then used it to hammer it into forged product, chains, and so forth. 1800s, it starts to move more and more east into the Midwest. As the fuel runs out, I mean, as the hardwood, we'll see, is lumbered out, it moves more west until, you know, about when it starts hitting the Mississippi River, the technology changes. So we, we don't see much. But it wasn't until the late 1860s that really Michigan realized the potential. The Civil War brought it on, although most of the iron made during the Civil War, okay, was made in Hawking Valley, Ohio. There were about 40 charcoal furnaces spread through maybe six or seven counties and the New York, Pennsylvania district. So really Michigan wasn't in play much. They were just starting. But as these Right at the end of the war, these areas in particular, Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, and so forth, were starting to be lumbered out. So there, there really wasn't fuel anymore. So they were looking for a different technology, experimenting with coal. Um, however, sitting, of course, up in Michigan, you had several advantages. By the 1860s, they were well aware of the iron ore deposits, but there was no real, without steamships, there was no good way to transport it yet during the Civil War. So, but they had that, they knew that the deposits were rich and large. Okay. And of course, there were lots of hardwood forests at that time in northern Michigan. Okay. The shipping lanes were good. If you could uh, make uh, pig iron, you could ship it around the world via the lakes. And actually, there were large limestone deposits. So all the necessary ingredients were sitting there in Michigan. And 
people that took notice of it were lumber, the lumber people, especially Elk Rapids, which really had been a lumbering operations for decades before. Okay, so Elk Rapids on Grand Traverse Bay, I'll show you a map in a minute, was it had the charcoal, had the hardwood, okay? And it could produce charcoal and those beehives you see there, we'll see more of them. Of course, they get the iron ore from upper Michigan, okay, across the, the, the lake, and then also limestone on Lake Superior across the lake, they got limestone. And then there were some limestone deposits in, the, in that part of Michigan as well, okay? So it was Dexter Noble was the company, and they, they were one of the biggest lumber companies in the United States. Of course, they wanted to use more lumber. Uh, one way is to produce charcoal. So they got the idea that one of the things that might work is to move into the iron, charcoal iron furnace business. Again, this is before the Andrew Carnegie's. Those are the steel, the the 1870 boom that brought everything to Pittsburgh and Cleveland and so forth. So right at the end here, they're looking at all this charcoal and all this resources they have, iron ore and so forth, and they move in and build a, a furnace there. Again, they had, it, it, the iron ore came from Upper Michigan. I think I said all this. This gives you the location there in Elk Rapids is on uh, Grand Traverse Bay. I think we'll, okay. Just a note here then on what I've been talking about hardwood and, and charcoal. The hardwood was actually cooked, you know, in, in these hot beehive furnaces, you see them there. And it took about two to three days. You load them up. I think it let, the ones at Elk Rapids and most places, they held 80 cords of wood, okay? And they would produce enough charcoal maybe for a, a day's production. Um, here's some more of the hot, you know, different shape, a little, little different shape. These are actually from Elk, these are actually Elk Rapids. Uh, they're no, they no longer exist. But these are old photographs. Again, an iron furnace would use 150 to 200 cord, cords of wood a day. Could quickly lumber out places, and as you'll see, it lumbered out uh, Michigan in the, in the northern part, uh, Lower Peninsula. Um, okay, here I give you the map. Here, I want you to note here on the left, Traverse Bay, the Traverse City, Elk Rapids is is in the bay there near Traverse City. Okay. So you can see they could get from the iron deposits from the Upper Peninsula shipped in, as well as uh, some of the uh, limestone there. And then they used the wood in the, in the Traverse City area. Of course, it's very famous. If you go to Traverse City, there's lots of old, good hardwood buildings and things around uh, that you'll see. And then they ship, they could ship the, the final iron or uh, iron pigs okay, to be used by foundries and steel plants. They could ship that, okay, down to Milwaukee, Detroit, Chicago, okay. So it was a good fit all around. Upper Michigan iron ore, like I say, was a good ore. It was a hematite, a very rich ore. And there was lots of it. The furnaces tended to be more on the lower peninsula, low, upper lower peninsula, and the southern side of the upper peninsula, I guess is the way to say it. Again, here's where Elk Rapids was. The iron for that particular furnace came across the lake from Muscovy. And here you see, now you, I think hopefully you can see it there, there's a loading dock to unload the, the ore and the limestone. I guess that's just another picture. A lot of people don't realize there were pretty significant limestone deposits in Michigan as well, upper Michigan. 
and, and also in lower but upper in particular that they could use. Of course, the limestone is a flux. You need the, the fuel, the carbon as fuel and to reduce the iron ore, okay? And then you need a flux. Uh, and that was the use of the limestone or dolomite, okay? The furnace was one of the largest at the time it was built, 1872 at Elk Rapids now. 47 feet high, 12 feet in diameter. Again, furnaces were being developed almost like, like uh, steel mills in China today. You know, they were coming up every month or so. So the record, they, they were the largest, probably lasted, you know, six months. And there would be a new one come along. Okay. The furnace would eventually close around 19... 11 and then briefly reopened for World War One. Actually, a lot of the old charcoal furnaces that had been laying in ruins were reopened for World War One again. Um, in terms of pig iron produced by the furnace, okay, they could make about 30 tons daily. Most of the pig iron from Elk Rapids went to Chicago, but from there it could move other places. It was a very good pig iron for that time. Probably only Swedish pig iron on the world market was better. So uh, it was very popular. And so it had a world market as well. 1870, 20% of uh, the United States pig iron were produced in Michigan. Um, and they ranked second in 1870 as a iron producer, okay? And census of 1880 report Michigan was the foremost producer of charcoal pig irons. And, and it would hold that for quite a while, okay? The technology was changed. Remember pig iron, I don't know how to say it, 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 it was used for cat, we would call it today cast iron. That type of, that's the product you're looking at. It's brittle. Uh, it's usually cast into things. It was, of course, a feed product for the steel industry. But the technology was changing there in the 1870s. Steel was no longer going to make pig iron pigs, cast pigs. They were going direct then from the blast furnace to a Bessemer converter. Uh, so things were changing technologically. But foundries, and there were lots of them in the United States, needed pig iron because they remelted the pig iron. Okay, so pig iron itself was a product on the major product on the market. Um, the production of pig iron also led to joint chemical production at, at the plant. For example, I showed you those beehive ovens where you made the charcoal. Well, one of the, the, the waste gases could be processed into wood alcohol. So that became a fairly good side business. And also you had acetate or lime acetate, which also was an industrial product, could be made into acetone. It was a base chemical, pretty much. Sterno is what we would use it as today, it was made as a fuel. So the Elk Rapids operation quickly was developing into a chemical plant operation as well. All this sort of ends, okay, like I say, in, well, it definitely ends at the end of in World War I, but it, we start to lumber out Michigan, uh, Northern Michigan, pretty good. If you go up there now, a lot of the areas were these furnaces. You can tell the furnaces were there because the stumps, and you get mainly pine now, versus the hardwoods, the great hardwoods that you wanted for charcoal are gone. Okay. Uh, and as I said, new technology was changing things too. Blast furnace, Bessemer steel route was different. Coal, these furnaces that, that were closed down in Pennsylvania and so forth, and they ran out of wood. Wood in the 1870s, 1880s, started switching to coal um, as a fuel, okay? 
charcoal was too light to, to import. I mean, if you're going to move something, you know, you want to move you know, iron ore, it's heavy. So, and then you also, what also changed, you might wonder why, why uh, nowadays we take all our iron ore from upper Michigan and, and ship it, but you couldn't do that well in these skipper type uh, ships. You had, really, they were waiting for steamships, which weren't really fully developed until the 1870s. You, you needed the power of steam to move iron ore in large amounts, uh, any distance. So all that was changing. Steam uh, ships were coming online. Now, if you look at Elk Rapids, this is what's left, <laughs> okay? That little stump there <laughs> is the Bosch. And that's pretty typical uh, of remains of charcoal furnaces around the country. So you wouldn't really, you know, these are easily lost. If you think about why I said there's so many of these furnaces around the country lost. I remember once when, when I was a young guy, we went on a vacation up in the Allegheny Mountains and the kids came back talking about some Indian thing they had found and went out there and it was actually a furnace. Uh, remains of a furnace. So uh, there's still a few to be found, I guess. Another interesting thing, and I was talking about this before the talk, is the slags of the furnace, okay, were dumped into the lakes, okay? Now, Leland is across the lake from Oak Rapids, but they basically used the same ore, okay, and they got a very special kind of slag. Uh, it's known as Leland Blue. Now, if you go to like Ann Arbor, you go to some of the shops there that's sold in the rock shops, the gem shops, and, and jewelry shops. Um, it's getting to be pretty expensive. I tried to get a piece for this, and it's coming. It's on its way, but it, it cost me a little piece. cost me about eh, 20 bucks. Some want a lot more than that. I mean, that was the cheapest I could get. So Leland Blue is popular now and you can still pick it up at the lakes if you go to elk rapids on uh, on the beach in the in the grand traverse bay you can uh, get the elk rapids or which is not quite as slag which is not quite that pretty blue there the, the of the leland furnace slag across the lake okay most slags are are, are not blue so and also there was that franklin frank ford michigan again over across the lake from Elk Rapids, they had a, they have what's known as Frankfurt Green, which is a powdery green, uh, which is also prized by collectors as a uh, beach stone. Um, and this shows some here. Color, we're not I'm not sure, and I'm a metallurgist, worked in the steel industry many, many years in slags. Pretty sure that, that it's a, a strange mix of a, Magnesia, manganese that causes the intense blue color. Uh, but it's very special oxidation state, trivalent manganese. Most manganese uh, is in slag, and, and most slags are gray green in general. So um, there's some people that suggest it's uh, iron impurities. I never had the slags checked, tell the truth. It's possible, unlikely. Copper usually stays in the uh, in the metal, and that doesn't usually uh, go to the slag. Um, but because of a lot of of uh, iron mixing with iron ore, or copper ore mixing with iron ore in Upper Michigan, it, it's possible. So you know they might make that conclusion. Um, right now, there's some archaeological work going on there, and I don't. I don't know who's doing it. They, they found some of the remains of the Elk Rapids tugboats in the river. And these tugboats were actually used to move the wood, not so much the iron ore. Um, and the company had a number of them. And you, know, you see some of the, the work they're doing, it's, they're sunken underneath. Um, the one ship, the Alcatraz, is the one they're trying to raise uh, and the picture down in the right there is a picture of the ship itself okay 
another thing that went on after it was lumbered out, Henry Ford, that there were large stumps left throughout Michigan at that time. Henry Ford goes in and buys them all up, okay? Because he's thinking he can still use these stumps. We said that one of the possible byproducts is wood alcohol, methanol. We, we talked about that. So, and he, he buys them up because he's what, at the time he was pushing wood alcohol to fuel the Model T. And he had a totally bio car that he had built in the 19, early 1930s. And that would run off of wood alcohol. Um, he wanted to make it totally plant driven. He also finds out the market for briquettes, for charcoal, <laughs> or grills in that big market. Uh, and it would later, and still today, is Kingston. I'm going to show that I'm a picture there. No, I don't. It's uh, Kingsford. I'm sorry, charcoal. I thought I had a good picture of that. That bad. It was eventually sold, and um, it went on to, like I say, Kingsford became a big man, and still is today. I think that's about all I, I, I really want to say.